Hello everybody, and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope you're doing well, and today we'll be doing a review of the 1952 Akira Kurosawa film, Ikiru, which uh, I just found out means and translates as to live, which I assume the title probably was very much relevant to the story about what it means to live. Before going any further, though, into my thoughts about this Kurosawa film, please be sure to smash that like button, light up the fire button if you're watching over on Odyssey, and make sure you hit subscribe and that bell notification. That way you get notified every time a new video goes out and anytime I go live. And for more information on that, you can check out my website, ombreviews.com. All right, let's dive into this review. Now, this is the first of the series of Akira Kurosawa films that I have been watching that is not based in the samurai culture. As you are probably well aware, if you look at my channel and the last several reviews that I've done, I have been on an Akira Kurosawa kick as of late. I've been watching a bunch of movies of his that I've never seen before. A lot of them have been recommended to me for a very long time. And because of it being summer, me being off of school, and also having time between the naps of Baby Thor, I've been able to squeeze a bunch of these films into... Uh, my viewing schedule, and I've been thoroughly impressed by everything that I have seen. This one, of course, though, is very different and very unique in that it is set in a more modern day for, for the time period, of course, when it was filmed, uh, a more modern day portrayal of... Um, you know, of the time era that's going on. And so this is a film directed, written, again, partly by Akira Kurosawa, uh, starring uh, Taka uh, Takashi Shimura, who, let me just first start out by saying, I think the best part of this movie and the strongest part of this movie, and I think most people would agree, is the performance by Takashi. I, I think that it is one of the most powerful, one of the most moving performances ever to be put on film. And it, it kind of amazes me that it's something that I don't feel gets talked about a whole lot in uh, in film studies. I remember that when I went through my undergrad, uh, you know, my entire undergrad, I think that we talked about Akira Kurosawa maybe only once or twice. And the only movie that was discussed was Seven Samurai, which, of course is oftentimes viewed as Kurosawa's best film, at the very least his most influential film, as it, of course, influenced later films like The Magnificent Seven and the idea of that trope of a village being under siege and being helped out. Even movies like Three Amigos, right, have been able to, to pick up uh, from the ideas of that movie. But not a lot was said about in that class about the other films in Akira Kurosawa's um, filmography, and especially no mention was made to Akira. And after having seen this movie, it actually very much upsets me that this movie was not talked about. I feel like this is a movie that almost demands to be talked about in any film class. I think if anyone's going to be able to understand Akira Kurosawa, you not only need to see, understand, and know about his samurai films, about his uh, Japanese period pieces, but then also about what he can do as far as drama and as far as being able to show the human person and human emotion on screen in such a real, raw, and visceral way. There's so many great moments in this film where you just have this close-up of the actor's face, of Shimura's face, and he has this, this sense of just looking um, you know, you see the sadness in his eyes. You see almost like the darkness that's in his soul. It's, it's about a character, not really a spoiler here, but it's about a character who finds out that it, he has stomach cancer and that he only has so many months left to live. And so it's like you are watching him go through these different stages of grief where at first it's just this empty emptiness. So his eyes get really big and he stares down and he stares just into nothingness. And he's trying to essentially, he's contemplating what what is life and what is death and, and what is going to happen to him now? And eventually, of course, it leads to him going through all these other places, right? Meeting somebody saying, oh, you, you have only so much time left to live. Let me show you what it's like to live. And it's, you know, let's go out to the bar and drink and let's go out and, and uh, be around a bunch of beautiful women and let's go to this and that. And none of it's fulfilling. And finally, there's a moment where he just screams and yells. And it's just like, no, this isn't it. This is not what it means to live. This is not real life. And then that's when his interactions with one of his coworkers who's trying to move on with her life, you know, younger coworker trying to leave the job that she's been working at because she sees it as being empty. She sees it as being worthless. And that's the other really cool theme of this movie is that it talks about the inefficiency of bureaucracy and really the corruption of bureaucracy, which as 
as someone who lives in an American system totally understands just how much red tape there is for so many things to get done and how there are things that should be very simple. Hey, let's build this or hey, let's do that. But you have to jump through so many hoops just to get anything done. This film also tackles that as well. And the obviously the main character here towards the end when he meets this and, and really talks to for the first time this younger co-worker of his trying to resign to move on to another job and another post hangs out with her and, and, and tries to sees the youthful, useful exuberance that she has and says, you know, how do you do it, right? How do you find this joy in life? And so she, he kind of like not really goes out with her, though everyone around them thinks that they're dating and that there's this, you know, inappropriate romance going on, even though it's, it's completely innocent. And, and he's just, no, I'm, I'm drawn to your youth. I'm drawn to how you find so much passion in life. Like, tell me your secret, eventually, is what he essentially says. You know, tell me what is your secret? How is it that you're able to... Um, enjoy life in such a way and she's like I, I don't have any I just I just live and it's at that moment where he kind of has this this realization where I can live no matter what I'm doing you know no matter what my occupation in life is as long as I live it with passion as long as I am doing the things that I I want to do as long as I'm doing the things that that I'm drawn to do I can make the best out of this life, regardless of occupation. And so he goes back to his job. And again, I know I'm getting kind of plot heavy here, but I think it is important. He, go, he goes back to his job and what does he do? First paper off his desk because he's been gone for several days and it's all about, you know, projects to build. He sees it, it's a park and he's like, we're gonna do it. I'm gonna get this done. I only have so much time left. I'm going to get this done. And what does he do? He cuts through the bureaucracy. He uses his emotions. He uses his sadness to like stare into the souls of everyone in the like thousand other departments that he has to get to approve just to get this park built. And then the park indeed gets built. And one of the most powerful sequences is really the last 30 to 45 minutes of the movie. Because of course, at one point in the film, the character dies. And there's this narrator that tells you a little bit in the beginning. And then when the character dies, tells you that as well. And then you're at their, the wake for him. And there's this discussion and this debate over who actually built the park. And of course, everyone's saying, oh, it's the bureaucracy. You know, we did our jobs. We stayed in our lane. We did everything that we were supposed to do. But then there's one or two who are like, no, 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 no. He built the park, right? Th this character is the one that built the park. It wasn't because of, of us. Yeah, we have jobs and we have you know certain responsibilities, but it was because of his drive. It was because of the fact that he recognized that if he didn't push, he recognized that if he didn't do something proactive, that it would just get the runaround. That just like all of the other projects and people who have been going to the government agencies being given the runaround, that this would happen. And he's like, no, 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 this is going to be the last thing that I do is I'm going to get this done. I'm, I'm not just going to be a part of of the machine. I'm not just going to be another cog in the machine sitting back and doing nothing. I'm actually going to do something. And it's just so powerful to see those last 30, 45 minutes. You see these flashbacks. You see the life and the purpose that this character now has. You also see the progression of as these characters get more and more drunk at the wake about how they're starting to recognize more and more how worthless their, their jobs have been up to this point, how he really was the reason that the park got built in the first place and you see them shift to say we're gonna change we're gonna change and then all of a sudden it fades to the next day now they're sober or rather uh, maybe not the next day but it fades to another time now they're sober and then they're given a project they're saying oh there's a sewage leak and what happens the cog in the machine continues but the one person who had been the one at the wake to say no this guy built this park this guy did something this guy cut through everything he stands up and he's like this is wrong mentally but then he looks around blank faces everyone's forgotten the promise everyone's forgotten the things they said before because obviously they were drunk when they said it they didn't really mean it because to do something in life is uncomfortable and that is what is the magic of this movie is that it talks about the importance of life it talks about what it means to truly live and it's not about success it's not about money it's about passion it's about am i living a life that i am passionately feeling towards and how can i use that passion to put forward my goals to help others 
because in the end, what he does is he serves others through his at, who, through his last actions. So anyway, uh, as it says here, the screenplay is partly inspired by Leo Tolstoy's 1886 novella, The Death of Ivan Illich. So again, how much of an influence there, I'm not quite sure. But man, oh man, this this film truly is fantastic. And obviously the most iconic shots, the one on the Criterion cover, it's the one that you can see here, is him on the swing in the park that he's built. And he's singing this song very low in the snow. And it's another song that, it's a song rather that he sang at a previous part of the movie. When he sang it at that point, it was out of pure sadness and depression and kind of just brought the mood down. But now he's by himself. He's in this park that he's built. And you can see now the song has an entirely new meaning because we're able to look at it through his eyes. And so I think absolutely this film is fantastic as far as the script is concerned. The story is very well done. The only issue I would have with the movie is that the transition from him living his life to the wake where they then go to the flashbacks i do feel is a bit odd it almost feels like this movie would have been better served had it been a little bit longer with like an intermission in between because i think it would have kind of helped to set that time uh, you know a little bit apart and would have made a little bit more sense for that reason but that's something that's very very minor as far as i'm concerned and it's also something that is not too distracting that i think that this film would be something to watch again and again and still be able to enjoy it even with that that, again, it's not really, it's not a, a truly abrupt movement uh, from one half to the other, but it is one where I think it could have been done a little bit better in that way if I, if I had to say anything negative, which again, it's very hard for me to even come up with anything negative to say about this. So if I had to give this movie a grade, I would give it a solid A. Uh, so again, this is probably one of Akira Kurosawa's best movies. I can see why a lot of people have a lot of passion about it. I remember when I had mentioned this on Instagram, when I mentioned this before, people were like, dude, this is the movie. Everyone talks about Seven Samurai, great movie, but Akira is where the heart is. And I agree, 1952 it really is an amazing film. And the only other thing, and this is not about the movie itself, but the only other gripe I would have is that the Criterion Collection edition that's available, at least the one on HBO Max, which, I, again, is the official one, uh, for some reason, I, I don't know why, even though this film was made in the 1950s, it looks like the only transfers or the only uh, reels that we have of the movie have a lot of damage done to them. It looks like there wasn't a lot of preservation done uh, for the film reels and so it's very sad to see that there's times when you can see that the, the colors are just or rather the, the lighting is just shifting and it's not because of, of the director's choice it's because of the film reel obviously not being uh, having those imperfections which again I think you know some people enjoy and I think that there is a place a time and place for those the small imperfections when you're watching a movie on film but it is interesting because I feel like a lot of the other blu-ray transfers and 4k transfers that we get of older films uh, look a lot better so I would love to see one day a, a proper 4k transfer of this movie to make it look even better than it already does uh, but again that's not on the film's uh, responsibility that's on the uh, the transfer so anyway solid a for this movie have you ever seen Akiru I know I went a little long there about the plot but I did think it was important uh, to mention those things let me know your thoughts about the film in the comment section below currently i'm watching throne of blood which is apparently inspired by actually absolutely is inspired by and it's an adaptation of shakespeare's play Macbeth. and so far very much enjoying uh the, the spin the take that kurosawa is having on that it's been awesome to dive into the kurosawa uh universe and thank y'all for all your recommendations of other kurosawa films to watch as well but let me know your thoughts about akiru in the comment section below if you like this video smash that like button light up that fire button it really does mean a lot you're all amazing and beautiful people i hope you all have a wonderful day and as always god bless and now for a huge shout out to all of my june patreon and subscribe star members andrew hoyle biffer de hobbit brian p dion don bruno de la mancha enrique evangelista father christopher miller hail to you father father damian cook garrett searles inflamed wood it's a trap productions jason clark jacob juice jeffrey toon jonathan carney laura the modern major general story mike jackson mad mitch dunaway mr peabody and his evil twin with the beautiful hair on to june orange hat reviews out of step with reality priscilla hall riff magos rosetta allen Teresa martin theodore benden and rather, Teresa Martin is Miss Martin Muses now. Tina Bojan, Tina B, 
and Washington Madranda. Thank you all very much for being my supporters on Patreon. And to my subscribe star peeps, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, Stand for John B., Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss slash the new number two, J. Ra the Beer Guru, Nevanon G. Adams, and ZK Man. Thank you all very much for being my subscribe star members. And if you want your name shouted out at the every at the end of every video and live stream, please consider joining on Patreon or Subscribe Star. You also get access at other tiers to things like a bi-monthly podcast, bi-monthly, bi-weekly weekly twice a month podcast that I do with John the Flick Pick Flickinger which is a lot of fun. There's also a tier in which you can join me once a month for the Chosen of Valhalla live stream where you all get to at that level, join me for discussions, talk about any projects that you might be working on, or just hang out and have a good time. It's a lot of fun. And also, too, for many of those levels, you also get access to a giveaway section on the Discord server where you get access to giveaways of things like 4K movies, digital codes, and tons of other stuff like that. So if any of that sounds interesting to you, check out the links in the description and sign up over on Patreon and Subscribestar. You guys are all amazing and beautiful people. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and as always, God bless.